got you on the arms room with Glenn. And John! Yay! Woo! I have a story for you boys. Oh, Lord. No shit, there I was. Knee deep in Mexican hookers and tequila? Yeah, but before we get to that, we got to talk about... Oh, okay. Our Wilderness Tactical Studio. Yeah, buddy. Love being involved with Wilderness Tactical. Good people. Uh, got their new Wombat bag as my only luggage on a trip out of town this weekend. Mm-hmm. Carried everything I needed. Mm-hmm. Um, very sturdy and durable and mm -hmm. makes a great pillow, as it turns out, when you get delayed in really? the airport, you bet. Hmm. And uh, great, solid backpack. You know, a lot of people balk sometimes at the prices of Wilderness Tactical stuff. But, uh, you know. You only have to buy it once. You only have to buy it once. Like, forever. It literally is, like, the only backpack. Because I, uh, I was talking, we were talking to Sam a while back, mm -hmm. and she was talking about the backpack she had been carrying. Yeah. Um, and she started carrying it in high school. Some, I, something like I that. I think. And she carried it all the way through high school, all the way through college. Yeah. And then she finally, just because she wanted something different, got a new one. Yeah, good luck getting your Jansport that far or your Condor bag. Yeah, buddy. So for an for an everyday carry bag, I mean, I like it. It's uh, it's pretty it's pretty adaptable for what I need. It's very sturdy and durable. And the pockets are well placed, and the internal rack system is kind of cool. Um, or Velcro system. I don't have the the actual rack system that they make, but the Velcro system is really cool. Mm -hmm. I, I like it, man. I, and it's got a the pads. Oh my god! Oh, dude, their shoulder straps. Make their yeah. shoulder straps like this because they're not cheap. Holy crap. That's why. That's why not everyone does that. Um, and those also have all most of the wilderness packs that have the outside pockets have a concealable pocket Correct. behind the yeah. big so right, pocket. Right here, there's a concealable pocket. So you could put yeah. your valuables or your goodies or your gun or, mm -hmm. or whatever if you're just trying to be a little more low key. Um, but I like it, man. Even just the fact that it stands up on its own is freaking cool. Oh, yeah. And it's got all the, you know, like you can even thread your belt on the back. It's a great bag. Very well thought out. Mason, Mason got one also. Yeah, I used mine to drill this one. weekend. How'd yours go at drill, man? I fit uh, a extra uniform, uh, two pairs of PTs, a uh, pair of civilian clothes, like socks and underwear for a couple days. Uh, like some, two day kit. Yeah, pretty much. And a, yeah, and a toilet kit and everything. Like everything I needed inside that bag. It doesn't look like it holds that much stuff at first, but then I was like packing stuff in there, and I was like, oh man. I just lived at it for two days. This is glorious. It's an awesome bag. Yeah. Plus, you know, I, it held up really well most of the bags that i get putting them inside vehicles and stuff like that there's all these sharp edges they always get torn up on it but i didn't have that problem so there'll be a picture on the Armstrong facebook page later this week so oh i uh, i also use their frequent flyer belt which i've actually never used before I've oh I, dude my metal i changed over to the frequent flyer about six months ago yeah way i love more, the fact that everyone sitting here is currently wearing wilderness belts yeah, yeah but fantastic. way more comfortable because uh, i like the original instructor belt and i i got into that belt when i started rock climbing sure. which i did several many moons ago i have a hard time imagining that yeah well i was never very good at it but i was persistent until it became inconvenient but anyhow i got into that then and then eventually i decided i wanted something a little bit lighter because that you know that, that's a heavy piece of equipment it so is. i went over to the frequent flyer try it out love it never going back so i used it i used it for the first time this weekend just plastic buckles and yeah i mean i was just able to get through security at the airport without having to take my belt off and that is kind of nice yeah it is i mean you know it's, it's like it makes a huge difference but it definitely makes a difference so uh that was great. No. Wow. Okay. Let's hear that. Cool story. I read about that in I Don't Care magazine. What fact, chapter, all my stories are in there. What I, are they? Uh, yeah. A lot of mine are in there as well. The show brought to you today by Hex Mag. Buy Again, some Hex Mags. We keep saying it. It's the time, man. Yep. It's time. You know who's going to win this election. We hope who's going to win, and then we know who's going to win. You better get in on getting the stuff you need. <sighs> it's about to be crazy. About to be? It's, it's already crazy, crazy but it's about to get crazy. Yo. Buy it cheap and stack it deep. Boys and, girls. And, and hex mags why not go ahead and stock up on those they're a great polymer magazine we had them on the show a couple of weeks ago last week yep uh, uh two weeks ago two weeks yeah and they're yeah, inexpensive yeah expensive magazine and what i like about hex yeah that's why it works We're pretty more expensive than the mag pulpy mag which everybody loves great that's neato mm -hmm. they're also a great polymer mag we've used them for a long time they're mm -hmm. a great mag hex mags more static there's mm -hmm. more you can do with them yep get some hex mags they look way cooler. And the new Series 2 are badass. They've got all, all the upgrades we wanted them to get. Stripper clip. Feed ramps. Yeah, yep. the little stripper clip guy. Yeah, I don't know. So, 
Uh, how about the Cox not Glocks thing? You saw that. <laughs> yeah, that was clean. That was legit. I it would be my, in California. Every day. I every, talked to my, I was in tech, I talked to my wife about that and she's like, so did all of those students get arrested or expelled from school? Usually I just assume because stuff like that's in California. They, they did in fact go against school policy. So they should have, uh, every one of those people walking around with a giant dildo should have been expelled from school. Right. But they weren't. Because that would be bad. Be we mean. can't do that because everyone deserves. No, God, no, they don't. Never mind. I'm just gonna stop before I. It's Texas, though. Yeah. I thought everybody loved guns in Texas. Everyone talks about Texas like it's well, the remember, state this is a, for this that is stuff. Well, remember, university, man. Yeah, well, it, what so University of Austin? They're, they're it's in Austin. They're importing people. No, I, think, I don't. I don't remember what it was. It was one Probably, of the yeah. one of the one of the hipster cities. Look, they have Texas. a right to peaceably assemble. Yes. Yep, but not with giant black. No, they even have a right to do that. Well, here's the problem. You, in fact, I was talking to Ed when I was coming back uh, last night at the airport. I got in a conversation with kind of an anti gun um, Whoa. It was a great conversation, actually. She was intelligent, and I was super what? And intelligent. And we had a great 10 to 15 minute conversation where at the end, the other person had good points. Yeah. I mean, it was a great you know, conversation. I mean, she never cried or yelled. Uh, my white privilege was never attacked. <laughs> No lives matter. I'm still waiting on that white privilege check, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, me too. So anyways, uh, you know, the kind of points that we were both really kind of came to the end of is, look, look we all have rights, but we also have responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You have a right to free speech and you have a right to wave your giant dildos or whatever they were waving all over the place or strap it on your backpack or whatever. I try but not to wave mine around. But it's also my right to like, the – to not do that, be like, don't be a dick, right? Right here, office yep, there rules. we go. For one, don't, don't be, be a, a dick, dick, right? And so it's just one of those things where it's, I don't know, people like that bother me a lot. You, know, you have a right to peaceably assemble. That's fine. You have a right to your opinion. I got no problem with that. Even if your opinion, I will fight to the, the I will fight to the death to, the, to defend your right yeah. to do that. I don't agree. You're an idiot, but. That's, you know, whatever. That's your right to be an idiot. So that's kind of whatever. That's where I stand on that. They're stupid. All right. Yeah. So I got to tell you about, I'll, I, want, I want to talk about this training I did this weekend, but first I got to talk to you about after the training. So uh, we're, we're coming, we're, the training was in LA and uh, me and, and a friend of mine that attended the training with me, we're, we're coming into LAX. We're almost to our terminal. All right. And uh, so we're at terminal six. My terminal is seven. His is six, but he's leaving after me. So we're just going to go to seven, hang out for a bit because we were there a couple hours early. Right. And this flood of people is heading our way. We're in the rental car shuttle. This flood of people is coming in. And we're like, oh, my gosh, what is all this? And people are screaming. And I'm like, oh, God, right? Yeah. What this is it? And, this is where I get to slay bodies. And, uh, yeah, with nothing because I'm in California. Hey, that's right? all right. You you had a so, backpack and a mink pin, right? Yeah. So we're uh, so we get off the bus. People are like, "Let me get on the bus." I mean, people are panicking, dude. It's madness. So I'm like, I'm the hell out of these people, right? Word. So me and my buddy, we we roll right out of there and cut through the crowd and get over to kind of this confined space area where there's nobody, and we start thinking about some stuff you know so i've got my med kit with me i got my lights with me i've got my ink seek anybody out right but you know if someone gets hurt or something i want to be an asset right so i'm like oh what's going on what's going on people are yelling shooter run all this kind of stuff right so long drawn out story short um the whole lax gets shut down the entire nothing in and nothing out Cops are rolling hard, man. There's freaking long guns everywhere. Um, they're searching the entire airport for the shooter. News is already popping up with like who the shooter is and all this kind of stuff, right? Freaking just ah, liberal media just mm, gets my spine all tense, my hackles up because there was no freaking shooter. What? Okay, some dumbass, weak ass people heard some loud noises. Panic and called 911. Security got on the horn and started yelling, shooter, run. And it's your government tax dollars at work, ladies and, and gentlemen. Uh, and the rest is, is history. What you would assume would happen. People, there were, I mean, people exited the airport. There was people crying and wailing and much gnashing of teeth. And, you know, meanwhile, we're just being chill, right? Because there's nothing going on. So it's like people are, I'm not on the phone communicating with people because what am I communicating? 
I'm Nothing. stuck at the airport. Yep. So like I sent my wife a text like, hey, stuck at the airport. I'm stuck at the airport. Looks like my flight might be delayed. Like until I have more info, what, what am I going to disseminate? But instantly we start jumping on the news channels and the forums and stuff, seeing what's going on. Oh, my gosh, dude. People are already on there. Active shooters. And it was all like this. a thermonuclear strike. Hey, where were all the three percenters that are going to stand up? And well, they, they were, were trying to fix their guns. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, their budget they rifles. Their budget rifles were not. Yeah, their bullet buttons budget. were malfunctioning. Yeah, their bullet buttons were broken. <laughs> Ha-ha. So, uh, so anyways, long story short, nothing happened. It was nothing, and they cleared the airport. But my flight was supposed to get in at midnight, and uh, I landed at three o five. So or that's no, why you were that's why you were tagging me in posts on Instagram at like two thirty in the morning. Yeah, dude, I had nothing else to do. Well, it wasn't I? I landed at two whatever time it was. Two fifty five. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, my my flight took off from LAX at like one fifteen. So I was probably tagging you before. Yeah. Yeah, because I was I was up late last night. You had a couple of hours, man. At the end. and the plane kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, it was a good time. And that's why we were almost late for the show today. But I'll tell you what, man. LAX, I was you know well oiled machine. I was impressed, man. Uh, as soon as a big ass airport. Bro. As soon as operations resumed, it was like as soon as they resumed, it took them a while to get things going because mm-hmm. obviously there's a lot of cogs that gotta you know work together in that giant wheel. But uh, as soon as they got it going. It ran, you know, they were redirecting flights as necessary. They were, they were putting different planes on different gates. I mean, they, there's a lot of dollars were lost sec- in those two security or three hours, rolled buddy. right through, um, yeah, as fast as they could. I was processed very expediently. Um, I was very impressed, you know, uh, stop and talk to a couple of police officers, say thanks for being out there and, uh, you know, kind of got some Intel from them a little bit. You know, amazing how friendly cops are. Like, you know, when you're not breaking the law and being yeah, a dick. You're, yeah, when right? you're not being a dick. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm standing there talking with a group of guys with long guns all tacked out. And and we're just talking like some buddies. And they're being cool because I walk up. Hey, guys, want to say thanks for coming out tonight. You know, and I understand it's probably a big pain in the ass for you. You know, I know what it's like to search a big old building and it sucks, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, and they're kind of talking. And we got a little bit of intel from them just by being friendly. Mm-hmm. You know, they're there to do their job. So they didn't need to be friendly to me. That's certainly not a requirement of their job, but they were. So that was appreciated. And I stopped and talked to a couple of them along the way. And Well, maybe it was part of that white privilege. Yeah, I think so. I think. Well, there was a couple black cops, but they were probably in on the white privilege. Some They were yeah. like grandfathered into some kind of yeah, – they were like they, honorary white privilege members. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> that must have been it. <laughs> there we go. We've insulted people today. Perfect Good job. We're off Already. to a good start. Yes. So I'm going to talk. I want to talk real briefly about the training I went to because I want to get onto the show because uh, we got an in studio guest that I want to uh, to talk with. And um, oh, I'm taking my moment today too. And and John's yeah. moment. All right. So black box training. Uh, I went through a class called counter custody uh, with uh, Ed Calderon. I'll put together through Triple Lot Design and uh, Drew. It was cool, man. Uh, it was cool. It wasn't quite what I expected. Um, I want to do kind of more conversation on the class and the concepts later. So we don't have enough time today. Uh, it wasn't quite what I expected, but going through the experience was definitely interesting. You know, um, learning about kind of some close quarters combatives uh, when you're bound. You know, we all know combatives, but how well do you know your combatives <laughs> when you got handcuffs on? Mm, you know, that's a good point. When you're zip tied, handcuffs. So everything we did was all based on bondage you know i mean you're you're hooked up well he called it bondage all weekend hey, yeah. <laughs> there is 1001 sexual innuendos that flew around that oh, class so glenn went to a weekend of bondage and i went to a bondage a weekend class. where a whole bunch of dudes tied each other up in dark rooms let's just get that out of the way all right uh That's funny. <clears throat> i'm still yeah. giggling there may or may not be a picture of this ass on ed's manifesto instagram page mm-hmm. all tied up with duct tape so, I saw that. that yeah. Mm, that ass, though. You can tell someone's doing their squats. Oh, well. <laughs> she should also shave it, but. <laughs> it's not a naked ass. Oh, oh, that was a different one. I think one. you're on a different no, website, never, never man. That's the, the, different way. Page. That's the picture page. he sent to us. <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Wrong page, guys. Uh, but the So the first day was mostly like combatives and kind of the idea of, of, you know, how to get out of custody and stay away from bad locations, how to kind of see through the bad guy's eyes, which is always the nuggets I'm honestly really looking for in training is the instructor's experience with evil, right? And, and what their experience has been. Because everyone's got different experiences. You know, some combat veteran dudes, their experience with evil is just they see bad stuff. Yeah. They didn't really get to shoot a lot of evil in the face. 
but they saw a lot of evil, right? They saw what the result was. Some guys were actually shooting evil in the face, but even that, their context is limited, right? Some guys were more higher ranking officers. They got to see the larger spectrum of evil. Some guys like Ed, you know, he spent a lot of time, uh, or he's, he's a Mexico, uh, Mexican, uh, national and he spent a lot of time working in law enforcement in Mexico. And so, you know, that his whole evil thing is a cartel, which are damn evil. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And, um, so I always like to get it from different perspectives. You know, everyone's kind of got a different idea of what evil is to them. And, uh, the second day was all escaping, you know, uh, handcuffs, zip ties, duct tape, how to hide tools on your body, what tools to hide, uh, really easy to hide the appropriate tools on your body. If you're going into a, a non-permissive environment where you think that kind of stuff might be uh, prevalent, um, you know, you're looking at the fact that you're probably going to be mostly stripped. So the stuff that you hide, you, you have to be very creative about how you weave it into your clothes and your underwear into your, you know, how do you, how do you transport stuff? You want to wear. They want to wear. So the anal stuff was talked about. That's not uh, was not practiced. Oh, okay. Uh, nice. Was not demonstrated. <laughs> But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, do what you do. It's actually one of the worst ways, you know, because how are you going to get access to it, yeah. you know, most of the time? And, and so it's people wear necklaces with their E and E stuff on it, or they put it in their boots or they put it in all this stuff's going to be taken from you they put it in their hats, you know, their belts. Most of that stuff gets stripped. I mean, when we were getting it toward the end of class where we were abducted, um, and, and we had to apply these techniques, you know, our abductors had 30 seconds to search us, right? Cause it's a quick hasty abduction. They abduct you 30 seconds to search you real quick, bind you up and get you in captivity. So it's not like they're not a cop. They don't have forever to frisk you. And, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say none of my tools got discovered. So by the time I got in there, uh, I, I was, I was ready, man. I had everything I needed to get out of my restraints and, and it was interesting. I mean, you didn't have a lot of time. We had one minute, uh, to get out of restraints it was not a lot of time. Uh, so it was, it was a really educational class. I definitely, class. there's stuff I'm going to take, there's stuff I'm going to leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll do more of a show on that later. Cause I definitely want to talk about some of those concepts, um, that we covered. Uh, so we'll, you know, we'll talk about that another time, but, uh, it was interesting. Nice. You know, if you want to see some more, look up Ed's manifesto on Instagram, um, look up Ed, uh, Calderon on Facebook, um, go to triple lot design and look up their black box training series. This is kind of the entry level thing. There's higher level stuff where they make you do really terrible things. Um, <clears throat> but it was interesting. Again, it's just a different perspective on things, which I'm always up for. I'm always up for a different perspective. You nice. know. So, anyways, yeah, that it was cool. It was good. What did you do this weekend, John? Uh, I went to a boots to business class. Yeah, how'd that go, man? Uh, it was actually really good. Uh, a classic example of I took away some things that uh, took away some information and got a lot of information. Um, it was a good class. Good. And then uh, I was actually here at the office yesterday doing some work for a few hours and then uh, spent some time with the family yesterday afternoon and back here to do it again today. Hell yeah. So uh, an interesting piece of gear that I had with me uh, all weekend. Mm. And that, uh, you know, normally when I'm going to go through security, I go ahead and I just, I just get as naked as possible, right? Yeah. As soon as I'm rolling into the airport, I'm like, watches off, stuff out of pockets. Mm-hmm. Everything just goes in my bag that's going to go through the scanner. That way I'm not holding up the line and I'm just processing through. Um, so I had taken off uh, my med kit and, you know, put it in my bag. But as soon as this potential something started happening, uh, boom, it comes right back on out. It goes right back on. And, uh, and you know, the med kit I'm talking about is we talked about it on the show, I think a couple times before, but it's my, uh, it's my Riker nylon gear, a fact. Nice. So we have Mike from Riker nylon gear. Wait, in the studio with us. I oh, know. Hey, what's up buddy? <laughs> now what's now that we on, have, man? now that we have video, it's weird to have guests when we do our intro. You know? Yeah. But, uh, how you doing Mike? Doing good. Good. Doing good. good. So, uh, I gotta tell you, man, I, I show this to everybody who will look at it and everybody loves it. There's nobody I've ever shown this to. Who's like, that's a bad idea. I wouldn't want to carry med supplies around with me. Everyone goes, Holy crap. You carry that around. Like, yeah, every day. Um, yeah, I, I really awesome. appreciate it. I carry mine every day and I don't even notice it's on anymore. It's like old pair of sweatpants, you know, yeah. just wear it and it works. Well, they're so lightweight, you know, uh, it's, it's not like an ankle holster with a gun. You know, people think of an ankle holster with a gun. It's going to be heavy. You know, it starts to kind of even throw off your gait. If you're not wearing something equally weighted on the other side, this weighs nothing. It absolutely weighs nothing. Goes, you know, mine goes through security. Uh, I do have to take out my, uh, my TK4L. I've, I've never tried to put it through security. I just don't want to find out. So I just pull it out, throw a SWAT team. My least favorite tourniquet, but certainly better than nothing. Uh, but I throw that in there. 
just so I know it's going to pass through security. But I like it because, you know, fold it up like this, you can put it, I can put it in my backpack, uh, like this one here. I can put it in a laptop case. I can throw it in the side pocket of a truck, um, you know, the map pockets or whatever. You can put it in a purse, you can put it in a diaper bag, whatever. But then, you know, if you're wearing the appropriate clothing or you're going to be, you know, potentially away from your bag, then you can take it off and easily put it around your ankle. And I'm of the opinion that anything not attached from you can be lost or taken. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, my background's the Coast Guard. And if you didn't have it on you, you weren't going to have it, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's why we did it. It weighs 2.5 ounces. Um, do a lot of backpacking in the past. I don't really have time for it now. But weight's a big consideration. And then you were talking about ankle holsters and guns. Mm -hmm. For years and years and years, I ankle carried a 26. And uh, that's, that's a lot when of weight. I, yeah, that's when I realized Jesus. that I needed – you know, to keep the weight down. Mm. I want it to be able to roll around because me medical gear is expensive. You know, uh, a lot of dudes can't, even officers especially, they can't afford to have quick clot, quick clot there and all these different items. It's one kit that you can either wear or take off, put in your bag or put in your range bag. So you don't have to have like five or six different kits with quick clot in it because it, it adds up. So. Now, my AFAC here, uh, or the ankle first aid kit, yeah. is, uh, what do these things retail for? About 45 bucks? Yeah, uh, 49 95 So, so yeah. 50 bucks. Um, you've got some distributors here in the local area. I know our Tactical Medic yeah, he's, is one he's of Yeah, he's our sole distributor right now. Oh, in, in Arizona. Okay. okay. So, I just took one of his uh, TTM Mark Threes mm -hmm. and put it in here. Nice. You know, uh, so you're talking 50 bucks for the kit. I think the TTM Mark III is 40 bucks, and it's got, you know, I've got my pressure bandage. It's I've 30 got for the Mark III. L. What's that? 30 for the Mark III. It's 30 bucks? Okay, so 30 bucks. 40 bucks for the Mark IV. Um, so I've got my pressure bandage. I've got TK4L tourniquet, set of gloves. I've got my quick clot. Uh, it's not the Combat Gods. It's their, uh, just their two-foot strip. I've got my flat pack tape, and then I've got a set of occlusive seals. All of that fits in there beautifully, comfortably, easily. Um, I wear that thing hiking. I wear it competition shooting. I wear it anytime I just want to be low pro, like when I'm in California in the airport, places like that. I just don't really want people to know what I've got on me. And um, you're talking less than 100 bucks, and you got a fully stocked med kit you can take everywhere with you. And I've improvised that to hold some other items as well. Like sometimes I do ankle carry when I'm in dress clothes. And I'll ankle, ankle carry a, a little subcompact nine millimeter. And without changing anything about the way this is set up, I slide my extra magazine in one of the pouches. Yeah, we're one of the things we're looking at doing later on is going to accommodate people in extra magazines. Like the military, um, when we first designed it, I sent it to some uh, acquaintances, and they they were using it overseas right away. Like literally a day at well. I'd say like a week after we made the first ones and they were using it for uh, SSE. Uh, a lot of guys were carrying like their credentials, passports, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, signal, signal flag, mm -hmm. it, it cut off a portion and put it in there. So like I have a friend that goes to Columbia to party all the time. So it, it's a great ankle wallet. If you think your wallet's going to get lifted, there's a, there's a million uses for it. I was actually, when we first des started designing it, I was looking at maybe gearing it towards a wallet but uh, we stuck with the, the AFAC. Well, I like the idea of the fact that, you know, it's not like a pre-made pouch in any way. Uh, I can put E&E stuff in there. I can put in, I mean, you could even build a wilderness survival kit out of it, which is kind of my next plan uh, to get one and, and put my wilderness survival stuff in it. So when I'm out backpacking, because that's always the thing. Again, anything not attached to you can be lost or taken. So, you know, I drop my backpack in the creek or, you know, I fall off a cliff. My, my backpack ends up somewhere else, you know what I mean, where it's, it's lost or damaged or things in there are no longer available to me because it's, you know, one, one ledge down or whatever. You know, I always put when I'm wearing cargo pants of some kind, I always put my, my survival kit in there, but I don't always wear those kinds of pants when I go backpacking. That's what I like about this thing is even if I was wearing shorts backpack, which I typically don't, but sometimes this is still not out of place in that environment. I would still happily wear it around my ankle, even though it's not covered, it wouldn't look out of place. You walk around town with this thing in shorts, it would look a little out of place. But in a backpacking environment, it's not going to look out of place. Not if you wear really tall socks with it. No, you are really Just tuck tall. it into your really tall socks. <laughs> Super tall. Just fold them over. Yeah, some oh, like yeah. tube socks, baby. Yes. 1975 called. <laughs> you need their socks back, buddy. Yeah, so, we, we've seen that before where uh, I had a buddy fall on a fillet knife. 
and uh, he was Ooh. away from camp. He just went down, rinsed off the fillet knife. He'd been using it for a week. He was all proud about it. Mm -hmm. Using it for a week without cleaning it. Went down, slipped on a log, and put a 12-inch fillet knife through his side. Oh, man. Ouch. Yeah, not good. So now tell us a little bit more before we start talking about more about the kit. Tell us more about how you got started in this whole thing. What what led to this? Okay, so uh, I do a lot of training. I do a lot of uh, different types of training, S survival, land nav, um, firearms courses, mostly pistol. So I was taking a course that my uh, friend was putting on, Chris, and it involved uh, first aid and CCW, EDC type kits and one thing that we were doing was we were shooting on the three yard line and when we started getting into the me medical portion we all had to walk 47 yards back to our bags get our stuff right and then come back up to the line so if, if i take one to the leg me being able to make it 47 yards and then still have enough blood to be able to do something it's probably not a good good idea so that was a light bulb moment um we've had a number of different instances in our past where we've uh could have used medical gear. And one of my buddies there who takes a ton of classes, he's been in your class, Tom. I don't know if you know, yeah. bigger guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He he was carrying with like a, a cheap Chinese uh, ankle kit and it kept falling apart and then he kept buying them. And uh, so I looked at his and then I talked to people uh, in the industry that know what kind of problems you're going to have. And basically I wanted to base it around the chest seal after talking to people in the know. So laid out a halo chest seal, and I said, how do I fit this? And then we went from there. And my uh, my ma, she, she does a lot of sewing. She just moved to the valley. So she came over and helped me out with the initial part because I've made custom gear for guys who uh, have high-risk jobs for a long time, but it wasn't necessarily with nylon. So Now, where did the, where, the name Riker come from? What is that? Uh, so for, for two years, I used to uh, volunteer with a search and rescue group. And uh, I love doing it. I just don't have the time anymore. But uh, my air scent dog, um, her name's Riker. So, and if you met her, she's feisty. It, it fits. Okay, so. makes sense. So now, you know, you kind of talk, talked about why the ankle, uh, why the med kit. But let's talk a little bit more about kind of the practical idea of why people should carry around med kits. I mean, you, you talked about the med kit idea from the range perspective. That makes sense, you know, because... Like, you know, we're out training, doing firearm stuff. We usually, uh, Carrie John's got a small, the bat kit uh, mm -hmm. that, that Redwire Gear makes that, uh, you know, that we throw in there. And uh, and that thing works perfectly because it's quick access, right hand, left hand. The yep. guy behind you can grab it. It's really easy to get to. Um, and, and but that looks our, really out of place if, you, if you're wearing it around on a place. normal day. You know. Yeah, it's, it fits right in on a range, right yep. in on a set of tactical gear or something, but obviously it's totally out of place in, yeah. in, in the real world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John's gear is awesome. And if, if you're on the range or something, belt line's ideal. You know what I mean? So I would rock those like I rock your sling. That thing's Sweet. Fine. Thanks, we'll, buddy. We'll plug there. So anyway, um, uh, if you carry a gun every day, why do you carry a gun? It's probably because you're not expecting to have a cop right there when you need them, right? Mm. Well, if you're carrying a gun, you're probably going to be reactive unless you're a bad guy. You, you know, likelihood of getting hurts so ems and firefighters america's heroes they're not going to be able to come in until the cops clear it so you're waiting a while to uh be able to to actually get assistance so i'd rather be my own first responder mm -hmm. i carry a gun because i want to be my own first responder i carry medical gear because i don't want to rely on other people um i have a good friend he actually watched his mob bleed out on the side of the road waiting for uh ems to uh come because she got hit by a car while they were running so i mean Jeez. he was real young you know didn't have the training and stuff and uh you don't want to be that guy so uh, i'll just say that so i mean expand a little bit more on that why, why do you think medical you say you train a lot you know knowing you outside of this room you know i know that a lot of the training you've been through it's very good stuff um but you still i mean when you are making a kit you still chose to make a med kit so why do you think medical is so important to everybody it's it's way more well carrying a gun is important but i think the medical gear is way more important because um medical gear you can use for a number of different things so you can get injured you know i've seen that we we're 
I've talked about that before. A guy bled out in a porta potty. You know, mm-hmm. he cut his hand. I don't know why. Why it's a went terrible in. place to die. <laughs> yeah. Like I can think of a lot of shitty places that I would not want to die at a porta john. So, oh John's my god, it's, t- it's terrible. So <laughs> I mean, gear. There's so many uses for that that it's unbelievable, and you can press it into to other uses, but um, it's just invaluable. It's the way I look at it. So now. How would you equate, like if you were going to say people should go out and get some kind of training and you were going to say, obviously, firearms is important, like you said, that's that's a necessary skill. Um, and you say, okay, medic, medical is necessary. If you were going to say, just your own, your own opinion, right? What do you think the balance should be for the average person? How much firearms training should they be looking out for versus how much kind of medical training should they be looking out for? So, uh- I, I fell into this hole and hopefully other people will learn from this and uh, not fall into this hole. I, I went heavy firearms, cool guy shit. You know yeah. I mean? It's so, sexy. And, yeah, it is. And uh, you know, I just kind of took the medical for granted and later on started doing the medical courses. I would hands down say, take medical courses. I mean, even the AFAC, a, a good, you know, IFAC class, good medical class, like independence training. Me and my wife went through there. Mm. Take your significant other because they may be the one that's going to be administering, you know, first aid to you because more than likely you're going to be the one at the most risk, you know. But I, I think the training portion is super, super important because there's a lot you can do with a little bit of gear if you have the knowledge, you know what I mean? You can do a lot more with with knowledge and a little bit of gear as opposed to, you know, having a ton of cool guy gear that you have no clue how to use. Well, we always like to say in our training that, you know, skills trump tools. You can have all the tools in the world. You know how to use them. It's not going to help you if you don't practice, if you're not proficient. It's not just knowing how. Like, people know how to put a tourniquet on. But how proficient are they at putting a tourniquet on when their hands are covered in blood or when it's dark or when they're in a hurry, you know? When they're not perfectly fit like Someone's, they are when they learn how to do it. Yeah. Exactly. And and I just think, you know, it's kind of coincidental. I sat for hours, you know, yesterday between all the lines we had to stand in and trying to get back through security and, and waiting just for updates. I mean, there's tons of people just standing around outside LAX just waiting for updates about what's going on. You finally get back in. There's this huge line of people just waiting to get through security. You know, then you get to your, uh, uh, we got to our gate, you know, and then it was first, it was like the plane was leaving at 1130 and then it was leaving at 1230 and it was leaving at one and it was 115. And finally we left at 115. So it's like all this time that I had uh, to think about what had just happened, you know, and, and I really started thinking about, okay, what did I really have on me? So let's say there was an active shooter. Mm -hmm. He was at terminal eight downstairs in the baggage claim, nowhere near where I was. All right. Or terminal yeah, Terminal 7 or Terminal 8, I don't remember which one. But he was downstairs in the baggage claim. I, I wasn't anywhere even near that, right? So everyone wants to, like, plug themselves. If only I would have been there, you know? Ha! In that active shooter, the damage I would have wielded, the hammer of God yeah, you would have, you know? And you're like, okay, cool. Based on your one CCW class six years ago, you may yeah. or may not have probably even gotten the thing out of the holster. But then you look at the instance of – so you're probably not going to be there when the thing's actually happening. And when it is really happening – even though lethal force might be uh, uh, legally viable, it might not be situationally survival viable, right? Uh, right. Yeah, it would be better absolutely. for me to just hunker down and let them pass and then do what I can to help the people in the wake, right? Um, sometimes that's the better choice. And so, and then you think about being in a, in a non-permissive environment like an airport, especially an airport in California, you know, mm. um, I mean, I think about a situation like that, you know, when we're flying in and out of airports when we're going to training. I mean, we literally have suitcases full of guns. So it's like, yeah, that's great. You just pop the locks and rack Whoop. them and jack them and you're in business, right? Counter party. But, uh, I mean, shoot, man. You know, sometimes we're rolling with, like, nod and all kinds of crazy stuff in those suit bag, or suitcases. But, you know, in this situation, I had almost nothing. But I did have a med kit. For a ranged weapon, I had nothing, you know? unless you found a downed officer or something, we're able to, you know, commandeer a weapon, which could be a really bad idea yeah, buddy. in an active shooter situation, being the guy with a gun. That's yep. not a cop, right? Wait, that could be a really that's, bad idea. That's bad. Yeah. It could be a um, target on your back kind of bad. So, yeah. so then you kind of got to look at it and say, maybe 
based on the reality, not the wet dream idea that people have about what they're going to freaking do in some, if only I was there situation. Sure. Um, yeah. I know I'm shattering dreams right now and everything, but maybe the more reality, more realistic thing of this is I had my med kit Yep. or that panic crowd of people that came running by, none of them needed to be shot. So if well, I had my gun, well, I don't know. Okay. In that situation, under those circumstances, okay, none of right. them needed to be shot. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> maybe I, later. I accept maybe that. Later. I accept those <laughs> terms, but um, if, if I would have had a gun, it wouldn't have mattered. I was useless with my gun last yeah. night. But if one of those people would have fallen, tripped, you know, there was a guy who was trying to evacuate. He was like, he was like the uh, like the fat hippo. You know what I mean? But he wasn't fatty. But he was broken. He was old well, guy with here a cane. We go again. Easy. I'm not ranting about fat people. Uh, but you know, he's like, you know, you see the herd run by, like in that movie Jumanji, the herd runs by, and, and then there's, there's like one rhino. Guy. Yeah. Like, he's like, uh, 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 he's like way behind everybody else. That was this guy, right? And of course, public service is not interested in helping that dude get out of here. Yeah. They're helping and finding the bad guy. You know, yeah. there's no medical people anywhere to be found. TSA, no. everyone's gone, evaporated. The only people inside that building are cops, and they're looking to shoot somebody. And that's that's all their priorities are. Yeah, buddy. Um, and then or detain or whatever, right? This guy is old, busted. He's got a cane. He's this foreign guy. His what I'm assuming is like son or, or something is with him. And he's trying to find a place for him to just sit down. And the guy is really busted up and he is not a fast mover, you know? And so identified that me and my buddy were able to go over and help him get to a location where he could sit down and be secure, right? We're looking for cover. I still don't know what's going on, right? Yeah. So we get this because at first they're like, we're just going to go inside and sit in those chairs. And I was like, nah, why don't you come out here with us? And and I know that's more comfortable, but over here, over here we've got this great set of cover where there's not a lot of people, i.e. targets, right? Mm -hmm. We're over here kind of by ourselves. And, uh, and you should come this with really us. really big concrete wall. Yeah, and we've got these like just huge x-ray machine thing in front of us. It's hiding us. It's both concealment. It's both cover. And, uh, you know, it's you should come sit with us. I had a, a potential medical situation, no shooting situations. Right. And then the whole thing, of course, turned out to be a farce anyways. And, uh, but there's still all these people, you got people who are dehydrated, uh, cause there's you know, no, all the shops shut down. Um, even when we got to our gates, there was, uh, there was only a vending machine. That was it. And there was, you know, 10, 12 people in line at any time. Just every vending machine was, you know, emptied. I'm sure by the end of the night, um, because all the shops were shut down. And so, you know, you've got all these potential medical situations where medical skills are all useful. How to deal with those kinds of things, how to look for someone who's too dehydrated, right? Mm -hmm. This person is a problem and we need to get a professional over here to handle this situation versus this person just being whiny. Like this one chick that was next to me. I don't think about hitting women often. All right. But when I do. <laughs> but when I do. You know? Usually for a really <laughs> good reason. Why don't we have any water? Nobody has water. Just relax. I don't know, sweetheart. Why didn't you carry a bottle of water with you? <laughs> so just like, well, that's what sucks. We came through security expecting the shops to be open, of course, because that's normally what you do, right? You can't bring liquids through security, so you buy water at the shop. But you can carry shop these. Shop to close. They, they make these reusable bottle things. Yeah, but. Metal, pla whatever, and you can empty those out and then true. take them through. And that's true. I've never. I've been in airports True. literally all over the world. They always have water fountains. They always have a water fountain. That's right. Or you can always improvise. Saying. Like I just I just stepped in and, and uh, got a refill on one of my water bottles because all the shops were closed, but when the restaurants had their door open. Yeah. And so there were still some people milling around in there, like some of the work. And I was like, hey, can I trouble you guys real quick? Yeah. Oh, you weren't a dick about something? No. And I was like, hey, can I trouble you guys real quick? And they're like, uh, what do you need? And I go, could you just fill this bottle up with water? Yeah. And they were like, oh, yeah, sure. Here's a freaking sink right here, you know? And meanwhile, yeah. people losing their mind. Where's the water? I'm like, it's right there in the sink, dude. Oh, wait. You weren't, you weren't a dick about something. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it's just right Notice there. the theme here, right people. There. There's a theme. <clears throat> don't be a dick. Yeah. Don't be a dick. So, uh, so you know, the medical skill portion is what we're getting at here. You know, the, the kind of general emergency response is 10 times more important than running and gunning to me. Yeah. Now, the majority of my business is... Is teaching people how running to and gunning, running right? Running and gunning. Because it's sexy and it's easy to get people. But I feel once we get people, guns are a good way to get people into the lifestyle. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, cool. I want to own guns. Guns go pew and they're a lot of fun. And then once they actually, especially our classes, since we're so lifestyle oriented, mm -hmm. you know, we're not just like, we're here to teach you how to shoot stuff and kill bad guys. Like, yeah, 
but we're also here to teach you about how to embrace a certain lifestyle that goes along with all that crap. Um, like not being fat, for example, right, John? Exactly. Yeah. Don't be fat. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, there's a certain lifestyle that goes around everything. But as we do that, I think more people get involved and interested in in medical stuff. Mm-hmm. So, what are some other EDC things? I mean, I know that's that's some of the training experience you've got, Mike. What's some of the EDC or everyday carry items outside of the gun world that you think people should be carrying around? So, I always have the medical kit, and then I have a small squirt multi-tool leatherman Mm -hmm. i love that thing love it to death and then uh, i have a small flashlight i still haven't found a big flashlight i like because um i've had problems with clips on knives like uh getting questioned on those so Mm -hmm. there's a number of places i i work full-time too and uh i can't wear a uh folding knife at work Not, not one that can be seen so it's just the way it is you know it it's their rules. I'm free to go work somewhere else, but, sure. but, uh, mm. so I, I, I kind of stay away from stuff with clips. Um, so that's, that's my big ones. I always have my medical kit, um, lock picking tools in case I lock myself out of my house, handcuff key and, uh, my squirt multi-tool and light lights, a big one. Um, uh, the after action review on like nine 11, that was one of the biggest <clears> things <throat> they were looking for. Yeah. Talking with one of my buddies. So nobody had lights. They couldn't see into places. So. Mm-hmm. Well, light's a big deal anyway. You know, again, it's a thing. Uh, I'm going to be posting up a photo on the Independence Training uh, Instagram later today about kind of my EDC stuff from my trip. You know, I always try to post like, hey, this is what I carried on this trip when I was flying. You know, mm-hmm. and it's got the belt. It's got the Riker. Um, it's got uh, my Redwire gear wallet. You know, things yeah, are buddy. minimalist and easy and lightweight and easy to travel with. My backpack here, my Wombat, and, and a light. I consider a light to be an absolutely necessary part of EDC. Um, you, it, it's great as a defensive tool. Uh-huh. It's a lot more useful as an everyday observation tool, uh, just identifying things, using it to identify. I found countless to, Legos under my couch say, with my freaking <clears throat> flashlight. Finding stuff with your light. Uh, yeah, I, I've done a lot more looking for mundane, everyday items. Yeah, buddy. You know, And so you, you, when you think about lights, um, you know that you carry. I mean, it's something I carry one in my pocket all the time and I carry I've carried the same light for years and I can carry it straight through security. I mean, obviously I can put a little scanner or whatever, but I can carry it straight through security. I've never been denied taking my flashlight. It also doesn't have like this crenellated skull bashing bezel, the you DNA know, collector, tactical, flashlight? Yeah. super high speed, whatever. Uh, it just looks like a freaking flashlight. And mm-hmm. so because it just looks like a flashlight, I've never been denied taking it. And I can pull it out. And so sometimes I do um, things in public to see how people react to them. When I know that I can do them appropriately without being like arrested or tackled to the ground, right? <laughs> like the whole dicks out for Harambe thing. I tried that in public. Don't. It's not funny. They don't think it's funny. But uh, <clears throat> oh God. see Glenn's hip. He pays attention to <laughs> modern culture. But uh but my flashlight, oh, right? So last night I sit down at my gate. There's tons of people and I'm like, I'm going to pull all my stuff out. My, my med kit. I'm going to pull out my flashlight. Um, I'm going to see what people say. I'm in a packed group of people. Hey, I always want to see what people notice. Not right? very much. Most of the time. So y- yeah. Cause I got another story that's interesting too. So <clears throat> as, uh, as I'm sitting there, it's, I'm tra- it's people everywhere. There's people everywhere at this gate. Cause our gate was both Boston and Phoenix. So it was insane. I mean, there was a couple hundred people standing there. And uh, so I I pull out my flashlights. I, I make no bones about what I'm doing. You know, I, I'm like kind of obvious about pulling, putting my... Hey, everyone, look at me. I'm and, taking all of my stuff out of my pocket. And nobody cares, right? Because it's a flashlight. I right. pull out my med kit. I'm like looking at people as I'm strapping on my ankle. I mean, I would honestly say 90% of people didn't even notice I was doing anything. So no. people are so, you know, boop, boop, boop on their little phone. Like that guy sitting over there in the corner? Like the guy over there, our, our quote-unquote show yeah, producer. What kind, of, what kind of douche would you yeah. sit over there and look at, like, modern news and stuff? <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, uh, put it on. Like, no, this is not a thing that looks scary. It doesn't look terrifying. It's relatively easy. You can see the bandage poking out the top. It doesn't look like anything scary. Um, it's it just, like, those are the kinds of things I want in my life are things that just look like I'm just another normal person. But when you talk about how, how unobservant people are, so yesterday, I got to go back to this, this counter custody class for just a second because we're talking about Please do. So <clears throat> I go back to, uh, or no, we go to lunch. I mean, we go to lunch to get food, and we have an hour and a half 
to eat and hide stuff on our bodies because when we come back from lunch, we're going to be abducted, right? And mm, if your stuff that's is good, and if and if our our stuff gets found, it gets worse, right? Oh well, like, yeah. Only one guy had more than two items found, and it was awful. I mean, they <laughs> bound him in such a way that he was not getting out of that by himself, and only through teamwork <laughs> did that guy get Start free. Start chewing this up. And uh, so I'm sitting there in a booth in a cheeseburger shop in LA and, uh, and my pant, my belt's open, my pants are undone and I'm threading a, like a handcuff shim into my underwear. And I, sh I got my shoes off cause I'm duct taping a saw blade to my foot and I'm doing all this crazy stuff. Right. And, and so is my buddy. We're doing the same. We're talking, we're trying to be kind of low key about it, but my pants are open. Right. Nobody notices. Nobody says anything. Or the or when people do notice, they're like, ah, they're I. They're just like another involved. Los Angeles experience, I guess. Yeah, you know like, I mean? Well, <laughs> I should have expected this. <laughs> but uh, anyway, my point is, like, most people aren't going to notice. Most people aren't going to say anything. Most people are oblivious in their own little world. But that being said, it's good to still be able to be the kind of person that you know that kind of blends in. And and one interesting thing. Um, that I actually that I, I heard this weekend at training was the whole gray man concept isn't uh, it's not really as valid as we wished it was. Mm -mm. You know, it's not about being gray. It's about kind of what are are you what people expect to see in that situation? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not because so many people try to be gray by by what they wear. They wear you know this uh, nondescript tank top, tactical and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, like, you're wearing stuff that still makes you stand out. Like, you can be a, the ultimate gray dude, right? But when you have a high and tight and full sleeve tats, everybody knows what you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can be wearing your your Hollister shirt That's with your a board shorts and your flip flops. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Not all veterans have full sleeves. That's true. But my point is, like, you start identifying certain things about the way people look or the way they carry themselves or whatever – you're going to kind of be made anyway. So the gray man idea isn't really as valid maybe as we want it to be. It's more of, are you what, what people expect to see mm -hmm. in that environment? Are you doing what people expect are expected to do in that environment? You know, I mean, even last night we kind of attracted a small crowd when people from the big crowd saw us not with the big crowd. You know, a couple of people came over and were what like, are you what, doing? what are you guys all about? You know, we're like, we're just over here not going to die, whatever's going on, you know. And uh, and we attracted a, a, some interesting people, you know, people who want to come over and talk and, and be uh, more engaged with the situation, you know, versus just the screaming masses. The herd mentality. So it's almost, you know, we're, we're kind of gray men to an extent. But we also kind of attract our own, mm -hmm. you know. And so anyways, I just, I, I think that as we look at things like this, med kit that we can hide on our bodies and, and kind of other EDC stuff. We also have to think about who's looking at us. Nobody. That's who. I, I do that all the time. <clears throat> I, I play like a little game where when we're out and about, I'm looking at people and trying to spot things, you mm -hmm. know, that's looking at the waistlines, the hands, mm -hmm. you know, ankles, stuff like that. And it, it is hilarious. Just a fun game mm -hmm. to where you're trying to pick out who's carrying, who's not carrying. We were, uh, eating breakfast one day and this guy walked in and I could only see the top of his shirt and his hat. And I go, he's going to be carrying and he, you know, he was totally tactical out. Sure. Came around the corner. Not only does he have like an outside the waistband, like a uh, non retention holster. Does, oh, he, Mike. does he even have the gun in there? Like he left his gun in his, in his car, you know, and I told the wife, he's got I said, an empty Uncle Mike's holster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we, we see a lot of weird things. Like it probably <clears throat> fell out while he was yeah, driving. It's, it's like his, stuck it's, between the seats between or seats. something. So anyway, I tried. I took a discreet picture and sent it to my buddy, and I told the wife, I was like, I guarantee we can figure out which car he's driving, and you know, it's probably got a gun in it. So we went outside, and sure enough, he's got a jacked up Jeep mm -hmm. and Magpul stickers all over it mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I'm like free gun you know mm -hmm. what i mean mm -hmm. so that's right funny. and he's busy in there eating breakfast or yeah. whatever like completely I clueless break this window and i mean i took a photo of him for christ's sake so mm -hmm. you notice and mm -hmm. he was like literally for me to you away mm -hmm. so yeah nobody cares about you like that that's the simple truth of the matter because <sighs> yeah. I, I i appendix carry yeah i go grocery shopping i have kids i go out in public quite a bit i pick my kids up i grab things off of tall shelves at stores my gun gets my gun's not always concealed 
Never had a single person notice. Never had a single person say anything. Never gotten any strange looks. Mm -hmm. I think the ones you have to look out for is the kids. Because kids yeah, notice kid, stuff. Kids, man. kids notice stuff. Yeah, right? I'm the same way. I've been carrying 18, 19 years, even before they had concealed carry laws. I was carrying. You know yeah. what I mean? Because it just nobody notices. I, you know. Well, and that is the interesting thing is most people just don't notice. Nope. They really don't notice. Uh, That's why they keep me around because of my childlike sense of wonder. <laughs> I just point everything out to him. Hey, Dad, what's that? We're like, Mason, stop looking at people. Don't, stop pointing. Don't point at people. Don't point at people. That's strange. <laughs> it's rude, son. What are you doing? So what's – uh? you know, you guys have this piece of equipment. It's awesome. Uh, and like I said, man, we tell everybody about it. I use mine – Pretty much every single day. If it's not on me, it's in a bag somewhere. It's somewhere close to me. Um, I love, obviously, I'm a huge fan of medical training. I'm a huge fan of having medical kits because, you know, the, the likelihood of me using a gun is so small. The likelihood of me using medic is freaking guaranteed. It's freaking guaranteed yeah, buddy. in your life that you will see a medical emergency or multiple medical emergencies where what you if, can be an asset. What if we had two, three, less than a handful of students? Less than a handful of students, have, at, you know, I've been ever used a gun. For, almost eight years, eight years ish, you know, training yeah. people and uh, two or I've, three students, I've right? had a, Something yeah, like le that? less than a handful of students actually poke people with guns. But how many have we had with, every like, month, dude, every almost, it was weekly there month. for a long time. For a while we had a lot of stuff, Just, you know, and it's not always like life threatening, crazy emergency. No. Sometimes it's simple stuff, but sometimes it is like, you know, we had, um, wilderness tactical. I think we talked about this on the show last week, but it bears mentioning a couple of weeks ago. We did. Yeah. Ago, so uh, Sam uh, over at Wilderness Tactical, who is a prepared person, you know, she carries yeah. a gun. She they they've got a lot of you know they got their own little ankle medical kit. They got all kinds of cool stuff that they're doing, and you know they're kind of big fans of concealed carry CC stuff. Just like this backpack doesn't look like a tactical backpack. Is what I like about it, and um, so they're kind of into you know the kind of eh, you know, it's kind of blended kind of idea. So there's a motorcycle accident out in front of their shop, and. Uh, and I'm going to kind of butcher the story here a little bit just to, for time's sake. But motorcycle accident, guys bleeding out. They go out to see what's going on. Uh, a, another dude is there, and he's got towels um, up against the wound, which, of course, isn't going to stop it. It's, it's, mm. it's catastrophic. So she runs back in and grabs a cat. Now, Sam has not been through one of our IFAT classes yet. Um, she's going through one now. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, but in, her, in the shop, we had shown them several times really one good time how to put the cat tourniquet on. We, we had just, because we were talking about stuff that goes in medical kits. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, this tourniquet works like this. This tourniquet works like that. Maybe you ought to consider this option. And so she was kind of like, well, how does this thing really work? And so I just showed her once, just one time, this is how the cat goes on. And so she's seen it one time, basically, and was able to direct this guy between her and Ralph. They were able to direct this guy on how, since his hands were already bloody and everything, on how to put that tourniquet on saved that guy's life. I mean, the cops, obviously because of HIPAA laws, as regular lay responders, we don't really know what happened, but the cops came back to get a report, said, you, you saved that dude's life. Mm -hmm. And you know that the guy who was a welder, um, he just went on to work, right? I mean, he that was his morning, and then he goes to work or whatever. And when he was talking afterwards, he said, you know, I believe God put me there. And what you believe in God or not, that's that's not point of the part of the story. It's that guy was put there for a reason, for whatever reason, he had the will to fight, mm -hmm. but he didn't have the skill to fight. That guy was willing to get in there and get bloody and try to save that dude's life. And if he would have stood there with that towel, he would have known what it was like to try to help someone who dies anyway. Yep. Instead, the right tools showed up and now the wills, you know, the will and the skills were combined and a life was saved. Yeah. I mean, like with the stop the bleed campaign, mm. hopefully they start doing a lot more around tourniquets and then mm -hmm. people start going to more of your IFAT mm -hmm. classes. But even uh, I one story of a, a guy made it to urgent care. He had uh, cut his uh, brachial artery. Uh, he was like doing some artsy thing with a pair and urgent care couldn't stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. So they called in uh, one of my buddies who's an officer went in there and he put a cat on him mm -hmm. and, you know, save the dude in the urgent care yep. with the doctor watching. Yep. Like, so you, you don't want to, just because you make it to the urgent care, the nurse practitioner may not be able to do it with mm -hmm. that little rubber band strap they have, the little latex one. You, you're best off having the stuff and being able to do it yourself or and teaching your family. You know, we you were talking about practicing earlier. Like we do it with our kids. Mm -hmm. And at first, 
I, I like to get the fake blood out, you know? Mm -hmm. And at first they were like startled and everything. And now they know, put the gloves on and they're like, ah, more fake blood. Ah. And then they, they move on with things, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it, take them out of their comfort zone. And that way they're, they're ready for that when it actually happens. So. And it seems, you know, people, because I train with my kids and, you know, we talk about that kind of stuff in class and people are like, really? I mean, how young are your kids? And I'm like, the, it's a, we're a family. So we all train together regardless of how old or how young or whatever. And, um, and that's just kind of, it becomes part of their lifestyle. It's like my kids and guns. Like, my kids don't care about guns. I mean, they like them. They enjoy shooting them. They like to hunt, shoot and do all that. But hey, I could probably no joke with the exception of my really young kids um, you know, with my older kids, I could probably no joke just leave a gun on the table and they, to them, it would be like me leaving a screwdriver on the table. It'd be like a cell phone or they're like, yeah, they're like, Oh, my, mine are, if I need that. If I need to shoot someone, then I'll pick that up and shoot them with the, otherwise there would be no reason for me to pick that up. Mine are identical. The only thing that worries me mm -hmm. is when they want to start bringing friends over yes. because like I can leave, like, uh, I just got kookery from Nepal, you mm -hmm. know, that thing will cut your arm off. I can leave that thing out downstairs on my desk and not even worry about like my sewing stuff, my scissors and stuff, leave that out. I normally fall asleep on the couch with my gun appendix, you know, right. and I'll take a four hour nap and they'll be laying on top of me. I don't worry at all right. because my kids are, you know, they know if they want to see something that's dangerous, they ask me and mm -hmm. then you look at it together safely. Mm -hmm. um, education's the key. You know, we're really, I, th I think that's where we're really messing up is we're not educating kids. So, they want to do it when you're not around and then they're curious and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. That's so you're I'm like done. parenting and stuff. Yeah. yeah, Parenting. What a novel idea. What? Yeah. Wait, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this four hour nap shit. <laughs> yeah. I'd like my to know more about this four yeah, hour nap. I, my kids have never done this four hour nap thing well, that you speak of. I, I work crazy hours. So like four hours is my sleep. That's like my, uh, this awesome kit. Um, not just medic stuff. I mean, it's, Technically the AFAC, but again, we you put wilderness survival stuff in there, uh, E&E stuff, your passport IDs, all those kinds of information so that, you know, you're not getting pickpocketed or it's, it's hard to take. If someone's going to rob you, they're probably not going to rob your ankle. That's not a common Because if they try to rob my ankle, they're going to get stomped. In there. Yeah, exactly. This is a quick, fast, and in a hurry thing unless there's a couple of them and one of them's restraining you, you know, they're not going to be robbing your ankle. You know, they may take your shoes. That's known to happen, but, you know, they're not going to try to start wrapping your ankle, you know what I mean? Or grabbing your ankle, I mean. So it's a good place to carry that emergency cash, whatever. Yeah, buddy. So with this badass piece of equipment, you got to have more stuff coming. Yeah, I do. Um, working full time and stuff. I like, I was listening to your wilderness podcast with Ralph on mm -hmm. guys. Awesome. A lot of the things I'm aligned with that I didn't even know, but um, you know, I like to make things to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not like making things to make money. And I want to make sure that the stuff I make actually works. So I, I don't want to just separate people from their cash. There's mm -hmm. a lot more to a business than making cash. I mm -hmm. totally believe that. So we have things in the pipe. Um, I'm never happy with anything. I'm always modifying other people's gear. I got a wilderness frequent flyer belt on. Awesome. I could make my own belt, but I use theirs, but I've even modified theirs, mm -hmm. you know? So I just want to make sure that uh, there's more things in the pipe. I just want to make sure that they're they're bulletproof and they, they work good and everything's good on them before I start selling them to people and taking their money. But people can buy the AFAC right now. Um, they can buy it from the Tactical Medic in Mesa. Yep. And they can also buy it directly from you. Yeah, they can buy it directly from me <laughs> or through the Tactical Medic. And what's um, your website? It is RikerNylongear.com. So it's R Y K E R. Yep. RikerNylongear.com. And you're on Instagram and you're on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Social media is all new to me. So I'm not exactly mm -hmm. excellent with it. I didn't get on it until a year ago when we started this up, but I'm figuring it out. But cool. we're on all those. But you've got some stuff up there, things for people to see and photos and yeah, information. Yeah. yeah. Photos of me <clears throat> cutting the pants off the wife when we're doing the training with the kids and all that stuff. Um, we got a. Uh, we may put up some more photos. I get all kinds of cool photos sent to me. You're probably the same way with training. Yeah. And it's like LE government guys. <clears> and I'm like, I love seeing them, but I like look at them and then just delete them because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Right. So. Um, so anything else you, you want to say before we, uh, before we roll out of here? No, just get training, you know, learn how to use the items and what items you want to stock and then look at the AFAC and buy one. Stock awesome. it and use it. It is an awesome kit. And again, just so many uses. Uh, 
your imagination is really the only thing that's going to stop you. Um, so again, Riker Nylon Gear, R-Y-K-E-R, uh, nylongear.com. Thanks, Mike, for coming in the studio, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, John, I didn't forget about you, dude. No, you're good, bro. Red Bar Gear Moon, go. Oh, God. Now i got to find it again. Uh, oh, what? Body armor. Oh, body, body armor. armor. Okay. Make sure your body armor fits right, because I know a lot of you guys have body armor, or at least I'm assuming a lot of our listeners have body armor. Make sure it fits right. Um, if you don't know how it's supposed to fit, go to the Independence Training YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, we did a series of videos with Air 500 well, a year and a half or so ago. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. a four or five video series, mm -hmm. um, and it goes over how it should fit, how to set it up to make sure that it fits properly. Um, so make sure your armor fits if you're going to wear it and you're going to use it and your life's going to depend on it. Make sure it fits you the right way. And then get your ass out there and train with it some because that stuff's not light. It looks cool sitting in your closet. Mm -hmm. Get out there, get it dirty, mess it up, do some work. But Find make out sure where stuff right. works and it doesn't yeah, work. Awesome. All right, Red Bar Gear moment brought to you by redwaregear.com. Make sure you check them out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube still coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> someday. Someday. Hey, but hey, as long as I owe it to you guys, you know I'm good for it. That's right. That's right. All right. So uh, remember, you can bring us out to train with you. You know, we've talked about medical training. Uh, we travel all over the country to do training. So you know, if you're listening to our show and we've, we've traveled around the country to, to train with other arms room listener shows who put on classes for us and hosted us. Uh, or arms, what I say, arms room listener shows, arms room show yeah. listeners. Yes, that's the one you yeah, wanted. They know you I'm running on three Either hours, way. man. Give me a break. <laughs> so, uh, uh, anyways, funny. yeah, you know, if you're interested well, in violin, if you're uh, if you're interested in in more information about hosting us and uh, and how to train for free with us, email us info at trainingaz.com. Uh, we're proud members of the Heroes Media Group. Make sure you check out their other shows. You can find them all over social media, Facebook. They're, I think all their show listings are up there. Mm -hmm. We're the best show, of course, but there are all other oh, awesome yeah. shows with all kinds of cool topics, yep. sports and news. Yeah, and if you live somewhere that has really nice weather and you want us to train with you, please. Call yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Florida in December would be nice. Right? Somewhere in Florida in December would be really nice. All right, remember that uh, with, the, with the Wilderness Tactical Studio comes that extra thing that we're doing. Um, and we, we already have a couple of people already lined up, but you know we're going to be doing it every single month. So don't think that you've missed your chance if you're hearing this. Um, we've got a budget, essentially, every month to be able to send uh, a law enforcement agency, a military organization, organization or a youth shooting organization, mm -hmm. gear that they need from Wilderness Tactical at no cost to them. Yeah, buddy. So if you're interested in that, if you fit one of those three groups, you know, we, we have a, a few very simple requirements for that. But if you're interested in that and you're one of those three groups, law enforcement, military, or uh, youth shooting, and you can't afford the gear, right? This isn't just an opportunity to get free shit. This is an opportunity if you and your agency, your group, whatever, can't afford it, um, it's not being provided to you, then go ahead and let us know. Just email us at the same email address, info at trainingaz.com and uh, we'll let you know what the requirements are we like i said we've already got a couple people lined up but we still have some left for the uh for the rest of the year so hit us up and let us know what you got going on yeah, buddy. next week next week's show we're gonna be talking about buying guns as an investment and how to build a well-rounded collection aha so basically we're talking about buying guns what you should buy where, why you should buy it, where you should buy it. We've mentioned the investment and not losing money on guns thing on the show enough times. The listeners have emailed me and been like, how? How do you do it? So we're going to oh, talk very about well. that. We're going to talk about that. We're going to give away some secrets. Yeah, get your clearances. All right. All right, guys, until next time, stay aware, stay safe, and train hard. You've been listening to The Arms Room. Oh, say, tell us that's not